<clears throat> hey, this is Nathan with Town Hall Project. I am really excited to be speaking today with Representative uh, Cindy Axney of Iowa's 3rd District. Thanks so much for taking the time. Um, Congresswoman Axney is a freshman in Congress and is the leading town hall holder um, in her class and of all the town hall pledging candidates. So uh, I think you're up to 63 so far this term, which is you know not just leading the freshman class, but I think you are just behind, I think you're third in all of Congress. So. Well, then I better um, get ahead of those two, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the, a couple of folks in Kansas and, uh, and in Oregon are, uh, are, are also aggressive pace setters. Um, so, you know, you have gone above and beyond the average and, and you know, the, the town hall pledge. Um, you really, again, set the pace. Why is it so important to you to hold town hall meetings and other conversations with your constituents? It's, it's, it, it, first and foremost, it's our job. Our job is to be a representative of the people that you serve. And I can't imagine a better way to understand the issues that your constituents are facing and then be able to come back and help with policy to address those issues than by going out and talking with folks face to face. Uh, I made uh, you know a promise to visit every county every month in my first year. Uh, and it was probably the best decision I've made for this seat because it's opened my eyes to so many issues that I wasn't aware of. You know, you think as a representative that you're fairly well versed with the issues facing your district, especially as a fifth generation Iowan whose family grew up there. But it's hard to imagine what's happening in other people's lives if you're not out there talking with them. So it's helped me address the issues that have been really valuable to the people in our state. Um, and really, quite honestly, come out here and just be dogged about moving those agendas forward. And I'll tell you one thing as well. It's the stories that people tell me that are so important to articulating what needs to be done in policy. And there's no better way to get that than going out and talking with people. That's fantastic. Um, so we see, you know, we track all town halls by all members of Congress. And we see that you do kind of the traditional town hall model. And then you also do kind of a more intimate, you call them connect with your congresswoman events. Um, what, are, what are the pros and cons of each? And what do you, what do you get out of the, the bigger ones versus the smaller ones? Yeah, so we, I mean, we tend to do the big ones in the urban areas where we know where it's, we're going to get a larger crowd to come. And then I'll visit very small towns, you know, 1,100 people, maybe less than that. Um, certainly sometimes less than that. So you really can't expect to have 100 or 200 people show up at that. I'm just pleased when we get a room full of folks over a cup of coffee that want to discuss the issues. You know, I think I approach both of the both the large town halls and the small connect with your congresswoman really from the same perspective. I give an overview of the work that's being done in Washington that I'm most specifically involved with, uh, issues that are facing our district and how I'm addressing those, and then open it up for people's direct questions about uh, what they'd like to see me do to better help uh, their lives and their families. And I do the exact same thing at a town hall. Uh, it's just less people get their direct questions answered because if you 100 versus 10, it's a lot easier for everybody in a 10-person connect with your congresswoman to be able to get their questions answered. So I'd say you know the, the big difference is really just the amount of people are there, but it's really dealt with the same. Uh, and the connect with your congresswoman does give us a little bit more time to really dig into some of the issues a little bit more and a little bit better back and forth response to really fine tune some potential opportunities that I could bring out to DC in that very short time frame where I'm talking with people. So that's one advantage of having less. It's, it's a lot like having a heck of a lot of round tables on very specific constituent issues. And, you know, I think that's a great thing to be able to do. And I'm really uh, happy that I'm able to do it for Iowa. That's great. Um, so with 63, I imagine some of them kind of kind of blur together. Um, but is there a recent um, town hall experience or a question or a story that a constituent shared that sort of sticks out in your mind as, as particularly impactful? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, there are so many. Uh, one, one town hall that really stands out is one that was done in our flooded area of Iowa in a town called Hamburg, uh, which was almost wiped off the map. Uh, with these recent floods and that town hall was really focused on the issues at hand, the flood. Uh, so I was able to bring in representatives from FEMA, Small Business Association, uh, you know, community development, uh, USDA, etc. Uh, to literally be on the ground helping these folks who are dealing with 
really life wrenching situation where their entire livelihood's been turned upside down. I, I remember the story of the Patels who own a motel in Hamburg and they couldn't get the loan that they needed from the Small Business Administration and I was able to connect them directly with a higher level person to see what we could do to move that agenda forward. Um, you know, th those are the stories when you're out talking with folks and, and I can directly hear from them what they're facing and, I've, and I can connect them with somebody, it's a great moment. Uh, you, know, you know, I heard from so many folks at that particular event about specific issues they were facing that were falling outside of kind of the parameters of what big organizations like FEMA does. And it gave us just that opportunity to connect two people together that maybe never would have had that opportunity because the congresswoman was saying, I need you to help this, exact, this person right here, right now. And I think that that was really one of the most impactful ones because it, it, it not only gave me an opportunity to come back to D.C. even more determined to ensure that every dollar that we got uh, put aside for this in the disaster bill got out to the folks in the district, but it made me more determined to hold every single one of those departments accountable, which is why we set up the Iowa Flood Funding Tracker to ensure that every dollar that was uh, appropriated gets out from those departments because now those folks know, listen, I'm, I'm tracking what you're doing. I'm making sure when you came down to Hamburg and you said you would do these things that you're actually following through on it. And that's the benefit of being out with people and the benefit of holding these types of uh, activities and um, connects. That's great. Yeah. I mean, one thing we're always trying to communicate is you know, a lot of people who are sort of partially engaged with politics is they see they see what goes on in the Congress and kind of the big high profile votes and things. But uh, you are, you know, you represent all your constituents um, to the government itself, right? That you're their advocate to the federal government. And when they need kind of help from the Small Business Administration or something else, you know, your office is, is a resource for your constituents, not just the people who voted for you or some folks who didn't vote, you know, that you're, you're representing all, all the folks in Iowa, three. Absolutely. I, I have literally said this from the beginning. I don't care what letter is behind somebody's name, whether it's an R, a D, or an I. I'm working for every single person in Iowa. And quite honestly, this the uh, Connect With Your Congresswoman uh, and my 16-county tour uh, really has been a building block for that because I found out issues that we're facing with rural entrepreneurship, with rural health care, with lack of broadband. Uh, I'm working on the WIPS Rural Broadband Task Force to address those issues. Uh, I'm writing rural health care bills to close the gap of reimbursement rates and lack of physicians. Uh, so, you know, it's really going out and listening to people, it's sitting down and talking with a clinic owner in a rural community about the fact that they get reimbursed 81% approximately of their cost compared to if you're owned by a hospital and you're in a bigger town, you get 100 to 103% reimbursement. How does some, how, no wonder we're seeing rural health care uh, really be, you know, on its last legs when government's not working to help it out. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's doing the exact opposite. So I came back and wrote a bill to close the reimbursement rate. That's the kind of stuff you hear when you're out talking with people. If you're just sitting in your office waiting for people to come in, you know, you're going to get the same groups over and over, uh, those who actually have... Uh, folks who can advocate, those who have jobs, that that's their job is to be a government relations person. Um, but you don't hear about those stories like I just told you, unless you're out there talking with people. And I would hope that every single representative and Senate member understands that that's their job, is to listen to the concerns of the people on the ground and then take that out here to Washington and write a law that perhaps absolutely helps them. Um, one issue that, again, that you know, doesn't matter if there's a D next to your name or an R or an I, is um, uh, prescription drug prices are just you know, going up and up and up every year. Um, I noticed on your website you have a, a survey of islands. Um, is this something you're hearing about a lot from, from folks at town halls? You know, we hear it all the time uh, from the uh, woman who works two jobs so her daughter can have the uh, medication that she needs to... Um, the parents uh, who, you know, one of them just takes half of their diabetes insulin so that they can make, uh, make it stretch and put food on the table. So this is unacceptable. And I think that we need to raise stories up like that across this country. So oftentimes we are in our own bubble and we don't see the issues other people are facing. And across our country, uh, not only are we leaving people behind with health care, 
but we're literally taxing the system because when somebody can't take their insulin, they become sick. Then they have to go in for an emergency you know, need. That just costs the system more. We need to do better by helping people lower the cost of prescription drugs, bring things like telehealth out to the entire country, uh, make sure that there's enough doctors and emergency services in all parts of this country to keep people healthy. Uh, and we could start eradicating a lot of the things that we're seeing. So we're going to continue to make healthcare a focus. I want to listen to more of those stories. Uh, most of the bills I've written have been related to stories, whether it's little Allie, who her family came to me early on, and uh, she has ectodermal dysplasia, which shows itself in children with teeth that don't grow in properly and sweat glands that don't work. And insurance companies weren't covering any procedure for that because they said, well, that's cosmetic. Well, there's nothing cosmetic about a child being able to chew and swallow because their whole intestinal system is disrupted. So I wrote a bill on that, and then a corresponding bill with Senator Ernston on the Senate side, and we're hoping that we see that actually written into law. But it truly is going out listening to these stories, and the healthcare stories are so vast. They're, they're so, uh, you know, for some folks, it's just a specific disease they have and not enough effort being put into that to help people with it. And in many cases, it's the, they can't afford their prescription drugs. So it's across the board, so many different issues facing healthcare today. Uh, and that's why we have to look at the whole system itself and ensure that the underlying structure, no matter what, you, what we want to call it down the road, is working for every single person. Yeah, okay. Um, last question. Um, you are, again, you're the, you're the pace setter in this historic freshman class, uh, holding town halls at a higher rate than any class uh, we've seen before. Um, at the same time, there are 198 of your colleagues that haven't held a single town hall or public forum of any kind uh, this, this term. Um, what would you say to encourage them uh, of, of why this is worth doing? Uh, why it's, you know, you're going to get some tough questions, you're going to get some friendly questions, but it, it, it makes you better, we hope, it makes you better at your job. Well, I, I would honestly say that if you're not willing to do town halls, you don't deserve to hold this position. End of story. The fact that people don't think it's their obligation who sit in a public uh, seat, who decide on the futures of the people that they represent, that they don't need to go out and talk with people is beyond me. I, I mean, really, it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's Honestly, to hear you say that, it's just so disappointing. I can't believe that almost 200 people aren't, liter aren't communicating on a regular basis with their constituents. And you can't tell me that they are when they're not going out and, and having any uh, town halls or connects. And so uh, I think what it's done, it's made, it, it's made a big difference in the people that I serve. I know that they see it. I know that they, I, uh, I have folks, I have Republicans and independents who are consistently telling me that I'm doing great work for them. Um, and that I'm standing up for their families and that I'm helping them be successful. So I would wager that any one of my colleagues, whether you're uh, what's a Democrat or Republican, you'd want that out of the opposite. If you're good at your job, if you're fighting hard for people and you're doing what you should be doing, you shouldn't be afraid to go out and talk to folks. And listen, I've had, I won one out of 16 counties. So I go into a lot of counties that don't have my supporters in there. And, you know, I've talked impeachment, um, you know, we've talked about pro-choice, which uh, some of my, uh, you know, f in, aren't for. And you know what, that's my job. If they're in a disagreement with me, I owe it to them to listen to them, explain my side of things, and always at least be sure that I'm hearing what they have to say. Because those are also things that I need to take into consideration. Even if I might not be on the same page as they are, I sure should understand why they're thinking that way. So if you don't have enough guts to go out and talk to your constituents, crime in Italy, you don't deserve to be in this job. Wow. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better. So. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, that forceful endorsement of why it is critical our lawmakers stay engaged with their constituents, hold town halls. Um, Congresswoman Axney, it has been an incredible pleasure talking to you today. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for taking the time, and um, we're excited to see the town hall's coming up in the future. Well, my pleasure. Maybe you'll make it to one. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs>